This episode of the Craftsman Online Podcast is sponsored by Bricks Masons. From elegant Masonic rings that showcase your commitment to our craft to finely crafted regalia and apparel that honor your tradition, Bricks Masons delivers quality and craftsmanship that truly stands out. Shop now at BricksMasons.com and use promo code CRAFTSMAN, that's C-R-A-F-T-S-M-E-N, to receive free shipping with your first order. The comments, opinions, and views shared during this program are of those individual Freemasons and do not reflect the official position of a Grand Lodge, Concordant Body, Appendant Body, Masonic Authority, or CraftsmanOnline.com. Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, the only five-star rated Masonic podcast endorsed by the Grand Lodge of New York. And now your host, worshipful brother, Michael Arce. Welcome back to the Craftsman Online Podcast. I'm excited to have a, a first-timer, and really, I made the joke, you basically come from a superstar lodge, and that's Aurora Grada Daystar Lodge, number 647, New York City. Brother Americo Paez, welcome to the podcast, brother. Uh, thank you, Brother Michael, and uh, it's quite an honor to have been asked to be on, and thank you for having me. Well, I've joked with another brother from your lodge, uh, Brother Jason Short, who is a, a regular contributor now to Craftsman Online with our blog articles. He also is on the reading panel, and brothers will remember him from being a, a featured guest on our podcast. But there's something special about your lodge, and before we get into our episode and I promise, brothers, we will get into talking about exploring the history of Freemasonry in Africa. Uh, America, I want to talk about what makes your lodge, to me, unique in that your, your master or the leaders of your lodge assigns papers, assigns the brothers to actually do work. So you're not a research lodge, but you're inspired to do and go seek that extra light in masonry. Tell us about that. Yeah, so our, our papers are not usually mandatory, but they're encouraged. Uh, when I first was petitioning, uh, I was told off the bat we were an education lodge, and I didn't know what that meant, but I liked education. I joined for the sim symbolism. I joined for the esoterics. Uh, and so being told off the bat that we were an education lodge uh, really attracted me. And when I became a Master Mason, once I was raised, I realized that while there is education in the lodge, uh, I was encouraged to weave myself into the uh, fabric of the lodge. Uh, and that meant if I wanted to learn more about something, I should research it and then bring that light to the lodge. And so, you know, you don't keep that light to yourself. And I think that's the sort of culture our lodge uh, continues going to this day. And you know, we have brothers who give long form talks, short talks, and we usually don't have a shortage of people willing to speak. I find that so encouraging and engaging, honestly, because I think a lot of brothers when, or a lot of men, when they're interested in Freemasonry, they really don't know what to expect. And hopefully they visit a couple lodges before, you know, making that connection with one that they feel really, you know, ident they can identify with. But along that way, you meet all these different personalities and traditions and styles of how lodges are. And as a newcomer to Freemasonry, you don't really understand it. And one of the things I think is unique about your lodge is that there is that, well, hey, if you're interested in this, we're giving you permission to be curious and to go seek about it. But then more importantly, why don't you come on back to Lodge and tell us what you've learned so that we all can learn together. And I really like that aspect of how you guys practice Freemasonry at Aurora Grata Day Star Lodge. So uh, big high fives to how you're doing things there in New York. There's no mistake, uh, February is Black History Month in America, and I saw your topic, your paper, and thought, okay, this is a great time to bring on Brother Americos. We're going to be exploring the history of Freemasonry in Africa. And some might be familiar with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's axiom on buildings, and I think a lot of that's true when it comes to American culture, how two things can be related to each other that never have any contact, but they can each, you know, still find that connection. So before we dive into your research on Freemasonry and in Africa, kind of tell me what your background is, why you had an interest in studying cultures in West and Central Africa and Cuba. Uh, the paper is actually on the, the spiritual aspects of Freemasonry um, and its connection with West Africa in particular and its diaspora. My interest is, well, I'm a Latino from the Bronx, and um, if anyone knows what that means is, 
it's almost impossible to not have that intersection to to meet people um who walk that path to maybe walk that path yourself um uh, you know and uh, it's always been an interest of mine it's always been a passion of mine uh long before freemasonry um one of the things was when i joined freemasonry it did feel like it was two passions you know that never the twain shall meet um it seems like two things i had to keep separate uh, because you know uh freemasonry is quite strictly abrahamic well as uh, the topic of this paper not so much then as i got deeper into freemasonry uh i realized that well, they do meet at some at certain levels. The Venn, the, the Venn diagram does exist, and there is something um, in that space where they come together. The, what inspired me to actually write the paper and present it, what gave me the courage, was actually I was watching an episode of Prince Hall of Think Tank, and they had as a guest speaker uh, Tahuti Evans. And the purpose of his presentation was to highlight the the cities in continental Africa mentioned in the Bible. And as part of the biblical narrative, therefore demonstrates that continental Africa and its people do have a part in the legacy of Freemasonry since our ritual is heavily derived from the Bible. And so that gave me the courage to sort of research this paper and present. What's fascinating to me about this is I remember uh, as a young person, I think, geez, it was probably the first paper I ever had to write for grade school. It was in eighth grade, I think we had to do a paper on ancient civilizations, and I drew the lucky card of Mesopotamia. Ooh, lucky you, actually. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I felt really lucky. At that age. <laughs> and I remember sitting there with, back then, there wasn't the internet. There was just encyclopedias, and you know, you'd go to the library and read all these books and take all these notes by hand and then have to write these papers by hand. And I was like, who cares about any of this stuff? <laughs> Here I am, you know, years later in my late 40s, and I'm witnessing the Haramic legend. And here it is. This is where everything, you know, creation, all of civilization basically took place was in these fertile areas. And so instantly in Freemasonry, there's that connection. I find it so fascinating that you, the, the spark got kind of lit with you seeing a, you know, a YouTube video with, with Prince Hall in a discussion there. Did you start making any connections to some of the ritual that we were performing, or were you going more for the historical research? Uh, that's a great question. I had seen a lot of the ritual similarities long long before the uh, the video. At first, I had assumed that it was just form follows function. Uh, there are a lot of initiatic societies in Africa and in Africa's diaspora. And so if you have a secret society or a society that needs privacy, you're going to have a procedure in which to bring people in, and so if you uh, if you study those those procedures, you're going to see this overlap. So I, I had noticed that before the, the the video. And the cultures that you focus on in your work, they each have a really unique history and adoption of what we would consider Westernization. Can you give us kind of a brief overview of these cultures and what led you to select them for this research work? Sure. So I'll start with the second part first, and then I'll uh, answer the first one. So the what caused me to uh, focus on these cultures were these are the cultures that um, uh, unfortunately suffered great um, representation in the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and so... Uh, there are ancestors. Their 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 ancestors are here with us uh, today, right? And so their contributions to the African diaspora are very real, you know. And a lot of people who are Masons today are descendants of those people. Um, so those cultures are very salient. Every culture that I picked um, does have representation in the Americas, going back minimum of two hundred years, sometimes as far back as four hundred years. Just that statement alone. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but it, my my mind is already spinning. I'm like, here's what's so fascinating about this is that these people were literally captured and then sold and sent over here to America where their traditions, their way of life was being, they, there was the, the attempt to remove that from them, but they were able to keep this alive and continue to pass it down through many generations. I find that really special. It, it, it's, a, it's a point of pride. Uh, not every group was successful. Uh, for example, you see here in in the Ameri in mainland the United States, uh, a lot of those practices were are survived much less. You did see a stricter hand here on the mainland U.S. Uh, 
once you get into the Caribbean, uh, Brazil, you see more survivals. Uh, Haiti, you see more survivals. But there is something there in all the populations, and that's what's wonderful. It shows to the resilience and the love they had for God as they perceived God uh, to to not just want to preserve it, but need to preserve. Let's talk about that for a second, because when we think of God or the you know, great architect of the universe here in America, we think of the God that we hear from or hear about the St. James version of the Bible, right? The Bible that I'm sure is in a lot of lodges all across the U.S. These cultures that you're learning and you're going to be telling us more about, were they praying to that same God or was their deity known as something else? That is a great question because, you know, it really depends on who you ask, right? So without getting into a uh, sectarian discussion, right? The, the, the logical answer is that if I believe that the God I'm worshiping created the universe and all things contained therein, and if you believe that the God that you're worshiping created all things in the universe and all things contained therein, can they logically be two different beings, right? Even if you have a different name, even if we have a different mythos behind that deity, can they be on a logical level? two different things right uh so on that point i would my my argument would be it's the same as interpreted differently to different cultures let's get to you had started to talk about some of these cultures and how they ended up here but who were these people before they came to the americas nigeria has over if you add the languages and dialects together over 400 um, as you know, the, the, the colonial borders that uh, during the scramble of Africa are European-made borders, and they do, themselves do not represent the actual um, cultural and, and linguistic heritage uh, of the people there within. There are many different ones. And so, and so we have to have this uh, safeguard to not overgeneralize. I know we have time limitations here, uh, so I am going to focus on just a couple. Uh, so uh, my main focus as far as Nigeria goes, and I'm also going to talk about the Congo uh, later, uh, but in Nigeria, my main focus is on the ethnic group called the Yoruba, and they believe in one almighty uh, overarching deity, God, named Olodumare. Yeah, he has many praise names. That's his chief one, also Olorum. Uh, and then many intermedi intermediary deities in between. So they are one of the biggest language groups, one of the biggest ethnic groups in Nigeria right now, they populate the southwestern portion of the country. In reading your paper, I was really surprised to learn that one of the cultures that you highlighted existed way before many of the early civilizations, like, as I mentioned, the Mesopotamians, but some of those that we may remember from a grade school, but all of them had their own form of, of some secret custom or ritual. And that's a really big part in making a Masonic connection. So what specific finding was like the first Masonic ritual-esque connection that you made in your research work? What I found was that virtually all, all the societies that created initiatic orders that, whose purpose was to separate the profane from the, uh, from the initiated, the ones that needed secrecy and the ones that needed privacy, all had rituals that you can sort of uh, connect to Freemasonry. Uh, the one I focus on first in my paper uh, is the Ogboni Society. Well, I do focus on one from the Igbo culture, uh, but that's more of a preamble. Uh, the one I'm more familiar with is Ogboni. Uh, and this is not me stretching. Uh, Noe Baudin, if I'm pronouncing his name right, was a missionary. And in 1885, he made that connection. That was before there were any Masonic lodges in Nigeria. He observed them, he observed the Gungun Society, he observed the Odo Society, and he says, these guys are acting like Freemasons because they perform their rituals in private. Now, just to be clear, the culture has many rituals and even initiations that are public. Rites of, rites of passage, ceremonies, uh, worship, worship is a public thing. But these particular groups did did and continue to perform their initiations and their rites in private. Some of them, for example, the Oro Society is male only. Ogboni uh, is very closely tied to the crown. So you know how in masonry we call uh, we call it the royal art. Ogboni is is very literally very literally tied uh, to the monarchy uh, in Nigeria. 
uh, for example, one of its, well, not, well, specifically the Yoruba people of Nigeria. Boni traditionally was in charge of selecting the new king. Just because you were the eldest son of a deceased king did not guarantee your seat on the throne. The males of the royal line, if they were eligible, uh, would have had, they would be, have been chosen for, by the Ogboni and other kingmakers. Remember, it's not universal throughout. And so they would not only be the ones to choose, they would be the ones to install, instruct the king on the values of the, of the culture and of the kingdom, make sure that the king knows his responsibilities, and God forbid, should he act tyrannical, it would have been their job to remove the king. Can't be more of a royal art than that. Um, and in between crowning kings, what they did mostly was uh, they served as a court of appeals. Now that we have a Western uh, judicial system, that has lessened quite a bit. But the court of appeals, basically, if your local elder, your local chieftain. So a lot of the things that Ogboni has that are very, very similar to masonry. The one of the, the esoteric ones is the use of the number three. And now, you, you know, like, you know that the use of the number three, you're going to find it in every culture, uh, in every mystic tradition. Uh, but the Ogboni take that to a, a, a different level. Uh, they're using the number three all the time. It's very overt in their usage. It's in their logo. It's in their emblem. Uh, it's in the way they greet each other. Uh, for them, three is everything. Uh, and for them, it's a very mystical thing to contemplate. It's sort of one of those things that, uh, and you might appreciate this, and, and the listener might appreciate this, it's not something that can just be said. It's something that has to be learned and absorbed and come to be understood what the true significance of the number three is. One of the more mystical things that come together uh, with masonry. Another one is that they they overtly refer to each other as uh, brothers and sisters. They use different language, obviously. They call themselves child of the mother. And so the idea that it is a fraternity is baked into the society, right? So you do have all across the culture, other initiatic orders, and they do consider themselves children of God. And, and yes, we have the same initiation, and therefore we are close. But Ogboni is one of the few that uses fraternal language uh, as a standard uh, way of identifying and talking amongst each other. For Ogboni, the need for secrecy was uh, a little bit more than just wages. So essentially, once a person is crowned king, they have uh, total power over life and death within their kingdom. They are the final arbiters of people's lives. And so imagine while the Ogboni are deliberating on who should be next, the crown king learns who spoke against them in council. What does he do? What the fear is the retribution. And so the fraternal language, the fraternal bonds, and the need for secrecy uh, was really a life saving device. So once the council came to a decision, in public, they spoke with one voice and always a one voice. They would not betray each other. And that trust literally meant life or death. When you look at Ogboni's function and you see the, the, the need and the, and the desire for the privacy that Masons desire uh, in our ceremonies, you, you see how these, were, these come from real roots, from real need in, the, in, in people's lives. The Craftsman Online Podcast is now sponsored by BricksMasons.com, our favorite destination for all of our Masonic shopping needs. Whether it's apparel for yourself or a cool gift idea for another brother, make BricksMasons.com your online marketplace where tradition meets innovation. Check out BricksMasons' newly added Masonic pendants. They're made of different high-quality materials featuring different designs, colors, sizes, and of course, a pendant and concordant bodies. These pendants are the perfect addition, imparting a distinctive Masonic touch to your favorite necklace, bracelet, or just allowing you to proudly showcase your Masonic pride. Visit BricksMasons.com and explore their extensive catalog. Elevate your Masonic experience with style and substance. 
Plus, Craftsman Online podcast listeners use promo code Craftsman, that's C-R-A-F-T-S-M-E-N, at checkout to enjoy free shipping with your first order. Brothers, do you remember how you felt when you were first called to Freemasonry? The excitement of each degree? If you can still feel that call of the East, you're encouraged to apply to join the Scottish Rite Northern Masonic Jurisdiction. The Scottish Rite offers Master Masons, like you, an opportunity to continue your Masonic journey and delve deeper into our craft through their 29 degrees. And there's an easy way to join the Scottish Rite. It's called Join the Rite Night. A virtual initiation where you can witness the requisite fourth degree and officially become a Scottish Rite Mason. There's seven opportunities to join online from February 1st to April 25th. Here's what you do. Visit the Scottish Rite online at srnmj.us and click on the Join button. You can also join in person at a Scottish Rite reunion near you. Your journey to the 32nd degree in Freemasonry awaits. Take the first step at srnmj.us and click on the Join button today. We're talking with Brother Americo Paez on his research paper, African and Afro-Diasporic Initiatic Structures. And one of the things that you had talked about was ritual, and that really made my ears perk up here, because for those that aren't initiated or familiar with it, ritual is a key part of Freemasonry. And you're thinking, okay, well, how would I see this in everyday life? The easiest way I could relate to seeing ritual would be, well, if you joined a fraternity or a sorority or some of the other social groups that are out there, they have their version of that. But another basic one I think most of us would be exposed to would be at church. Um, with religion. If you think of uh, baptism, that is a form of ritual. Uh, if you've gone to a Catholic church and you've seen the Stations of the Cross, for example, that would be a form of ritual, just like reading of verses in any other church or the Torah in a, a temple or a, a synagogue. Plus, I think some of the things that kind of add to the mystery or the allure or what makes a, a ritual stand out is that the people who perform it, they tend to wear a certain type of clothing, or the initiate is wearing a certain type of clothing. There's special titles that are used when identifying people in rooms or positions or places or stations. And then, of course, there's the words, or as we would call it in Freemasonry, the work, which is really what defines the ritual. So one of the things that's kind of unique about Freemasonry, and I wanted to see if we could explore uh, this as well with some of the cultures that you studied into your paper, is that most Masonic ritual, I would say, could be classified as esoteric. Well, like, yes, it's deeply influenced um, with some religious views or uh, context that's in there for historical purposes. Much of the lessons of Freemasonry are esoteric. Did you find that the ritual that was being practiced in some of these cultures lean more on the esoteric side of ritual, or were they more religious or spiritual per se? I would say they're not mutually exclusive, those two things, but I would make the distinction that all these uh, cultures and these rites that I mentioned in my paper are in fact religions. Um, so I don't want there to be any confusion about that. Uh, Freemasonry is not a religion, it is the handmaiden of religion, so far interwoven. Uh, but these cultures that I, I and these rituals that I, I reference are all religions. So that's, that's so you are going to see that. Um, in each of those rituals that I mentioned in the paper, can be studied for years. The the ceremonies themselves range from uh, very simple one day affairs to seven day affairs, right? So they 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 you know some rituals require being enclosed for for seven days. Others it's really a one day thing. Others it's a three day thing. Again, Africa is such a varied place. I, I hate to generalize, and so these rites just represent the like a whole gambit. Uh, but yes, it's certainly a religious thing. But each of those things have deeper meaning, right? When you first get initiated, you, you, you a lot of the times, they're like in masonry. After a certain amount, you, you know, you're drinking water from the fire hose, you're not getting it all, right? I, I, I've given the, uh, uh, the first degree lecture enough times to see the glassy eyes, <laughs> right? That's a good quote. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the night, right? And so that, that, that also happens in other cultures as well, where... It, it might be too much for the first time, and then you, uh, the initiate, goes from initiate to priest by dedication to the craft, to the to the to the group, to the society, or whatever. And yes, and they start being ingrained in esoterics. One thing to notice is that 
for example, in Ogboni, also in the Kimbisa, Congo, in Cuba, there are degrees, uh, but one of the ways you can get advancement, Masons would call passwords. And so that becomes a sign of your advancement. And so, yes, you are being taught these esoterics and these symbols things that are not necessarily open to the public. You're not really going to find it in a book. You get this at the foot of your other. I'm one of those brothers that once you learn and you start to get interested in the structure of Masonic ritual, you're like, well, what would be the origins of this? Not necessarily the words and what they're talking about, but how this is being done. We spent a lot of time talking about Africa, and it's, it's fascinating with the cultures that are there and also the relativity to that in, in the Middle East, which then kind of starts to connect with Europe and the beginning of the the societies that were happening there and the cultures that would spring from there that would really take a global perspective and even till today are still influencing places. But we don't really know where Freemasonry officially began. There's conversations that, oh, it, it could have been the ancient Egyptians or maybe um, it could have been the, the guild stone workers in you know, Europe back in the day or based on some of the research that you've outlined and some of the things you've discovered, traces of Freemasonry could have even began there where all of life eventually started from, which would have been on the continent of Africa. How did Freemasonry enter this and, and become identified in these cultures? Was it when the Templars came through North Africa in the 12th century, or did it take time later on when the Europeans and everyone were, were beginning to make their pilgrimages and set up the colonies? So the specific cultures that I focus on in my paper it would be the European colonial contact. Um, if we go down to the Congo, we actually don't see any masonry during the colonial period. Uh, very the the Catholic uh, Portuguese, very Catholic uh, colonial power. You don't really see a lot of masonry there. However, in the English colonies like Nigeria, you do see you do see the in inroads uh, coming into Nigeria late 19th century, early 20th century. So the first provisional Grand Master uh, of Nigeria, uh, well, really the fifth, first slash fifth, and I'll explain that in a second, uh, was Adeyemo Alakija. Born in Nigeria, educated uh, in England, comes back, he's a successful businessman, uh, successful publisher. He was not the first provincial Grand Master, but the first provincial Grand Master was the provincial Grand Master for all of Ivory Gold Coast and sort of had a broad scope. Uh, but he was the first one to be provincial grandmaster of Nigeria specifically. And so here's this interesting thing. There was this other, an Ogboni initiate, uh, uh, who hold the rank of Akwana. He valued his cultural heritage in Ogboni, but because, like, like I said before, it is a religion, he wanted to create something uh, that was consistent with his Christian values, but at the same time, honor the tradition of Ogboni. And so now Alakija comes back, prominent Freemason, they get together and they create uh, what was first called Christian Ogboni, a Christianized version of Ogboni called Ogboni Onigbagbo. Then it would later be called Reformed Ogboni when it began including Muslims. Uh, Alakija came in and gave the, the structure, the westernization elements needed to make it successful in the new uh, colonial environment. While um, Ogumbi, the uh, Ogboni person, he gave it the tradition. And so in, in, in the reformed Ogboni fraternity exists to this day. What was the reception like? I'm just curious, because until you mentioned that there was actually a local that had risen into the ranks of uh, like a leadership position uh, in, in Africa. I'm just curious because we got a lot of our Freemasonry here in the United States, thanks to the English soldiers that came over and brought that with them. but. You know, the American colonists were already here. Americans, you know, English was already established. That, that way of life, that culture was already here. Bringing Freemasonry into some of those parts of the world could have been almost like water and oil. <laughs> you know, just would have been complete. So I'm just curious, were, were, did they look at it as, especially when you mentioned like the Portuguese and being, you know, very strict to the Catholic faith. Um, we know that the, the papal bull edict then forbid Catholics from seeking Freemasonry. What were their thoughts on it? Yeah, as far as I can tell, it was successful. Mm. People well-to-do, people of means, uh, just as we've heard 
Freemasonry in England was and amongst the uh, the royalty or the, the gentleman society. And that seemed to have been what Freemasonry was and, and continues to be uh, in Nigeria. So it was uh, very well received as far as I can tell. So let's pick up our boat and, and sail a little bit across the world and we'll land over in the Congo and then in Cuba, which, as you had mentioned, you know, the travels of these people from their original place in Africa, they were being taken away and across the oceans and some ended up in the Caribbean. What was their life like there and how did they find Freemasonry? So before I get to that, you did you did ask the question and I completely ignored it and I apologize um, about the Templars and, and all that. And, and the answer to that question is actually going to be a good preface for the answer to this question. Uh, so while the Templars did not reach, uh, as far as I know, Central Africa and, and Central West Africa, the, the ethnic groups that are the focus of my paper, uh, what did happen was, as we all know, uh, the Templar Order was disbanded. Portugal, you basically had a lot of out-of-work knights, and the king of Portugal at the time, and I forgot his name, uh, he basically petitioned to get his own military order, and he was granted, and it, it became called uh, the Order of the Knights of Christ. It still exists to this day. So after the the wars in the Holy Land ended, the the purpose of these uh, military orders had to change, uh, and so the what the Crown of Portugal did was use this military order to further the interest of the crown and of the Portuguese church uh, abroad. Now, as you know, as your readers, uh, your listeners know, uh, Portugal was one of the first major seafarers as far as colonialization goes. And uh, they reached the Congo 14, I want to say 83. They were exploring the whole region. That's kind of like where the whole thing with Columbus started. So they were getting around. And once they established themselves, they were uh, setting up colonies, setting up trade. And one of the things that the Order of the Knights of Christ was used for was to promote the church and, and promote everything. The King of Congo, and this is very important to, to, to answer your question, the King of Congo at that time, uh, in Zingenku, he converted to Christianity instantly with no fuss and no fight. And there's a lot of theories as to why. And one of the things that once he was acknowledged as a Catholic king, he was entitled to also uh, be the head of the, the Catholic military order. And so we see that the Order of the Knights of Christ, since the Portuguese presence uh, in, the, in the Congo, was present. We have grave sites with uh, the Templar cross and the Knights of Christ cross looks identical if there's no color involved, right? Uh, we have the swords that were uh, forged, that were used as ceremonial swords. They've been found at burial sites. Um, it's it's very well known. The Order of the Knights of Christ is still held within the royal families of the Congo, and it's still being given out from there. So it it it, it has a 400 year continual existence in the Congo. Here's the thing: slavers don't necessarily ask, "Hey, are you a knight?" Before picking you up, right? Um, you know, and I, I I don't mean to say that lightly. It's it's a horrible thing, but because the king converted so early on, a lot of his people converted. They didn't always convert fully. And what you see in the Congo is a lot of syncretism. You had a lot of people who were, who considered themselves to be true Christians and still and still held on to other practices, uh, traditional practices. And so you have these people, these were the people uh, who were captured, right? And they were brought over. In, in the earliest records, for example, in Cuba, Cuba had a system called the Cabildo system which are essentially mutual aid societies where uh, the enslaved of different ethnic groups were allowed to meet and, you know, do their thing. They were each allowed to select the king. What's interesting is the Congo uh, in Havana, Cuba, the capital, had five distinct cabildos for people of Congolese Bantu origin. And the reason why they had five was because there are different um, sub, uh, sub languages. The main one, the king there actually titled himself the King of Musundi, which is where the burial site where the sword was found. And he also called himself, once he took the crown, whoever took that seat, it was a four-year term, once he took the seat, called himself King Solomon. Ah-ha-ha! Uh -huh. Yes. And so we have, re we have records of this. 
Now, we have no way of knowing whether that's biblical or Masonic, but we know that at, at, in the 19th century, in the 19th century, once the person was elected as the king of the Cabildo, he referred to himself as King Salah. In, in Cuba, uh, at least the Havana, uh, the Havana initiation that I'm aware of, uh, a lot of the uh, ritual has many parallels to the Masonic ritual. And it is a weird thing when you're talking about multiple uh, secret societies, you, you can't say anything, right? <laughs> uh, but I'll do some some very uh, broad level stuff. The 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 uh, conversation between the person on the outside and the person on the inside. Uh, one of the things in my paper, and since this is a a painting that's uh, very well uh, widespread on the internet and not really letting anything out uh, out of the uh, uh, out of the bag, is you see three initiates, right, bare chested blindfolded. They're kneeling before the ritual leader. And in one hand, he has the crucifix, and in the other hand, he has a candle. If you blind yourself because of the African elements of that painting, you won't see it. But if you step back, everything I just mentioned should be very, very, very familiar to a Freemason. So the question is, did form follow function? We know of at, at least three indigenous initiatic orders in the Congo uh, that were very widespread. They had many, 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 but three uh, held the uh, the attention of uh, traditionalists and anthropologists alike. They were the Kimpasi order, the Inkimba order, and the Lemba order. Now, this is not the Lemba, the ethnic group Lemba from South Africa. This is a separate Lemba order. The Inkimba order was considered the uh, order of the the warrior class. It was an initiatic society. They had a dying and rebirthing thing going on. The Lemba were considered, I don't want to say talk about them in the past tense, they're, they're still around, a, a marriage society. Now, why, why marriage? Why, what, what does that have to do with this? Well, because in Congo society, marriages uh, seal unions between families and clans. And so, uh, so the Lemba were are the the society of mercantilism. And so they kept the pact between clans tight through marriage, right? Um, so they were the merchant class and the Kimpasi were considered the priest class. Now, obviously each of these were priests in their own right because these were religious ceremonies. Now, one thing that I noticed is that it has a very, very uh, close parallel to Angel Miller's theory on the three stages of initiation, the uh, the craftsman, uh, the warrior, and the priest. Uh, and so so you see that. And so this was all carried over. The uh, In Cuba, the word in Kimba is not a separate society. It's the word for initiation. A lot of people suspect that Kimpasi had its, uh, vowel, its syllables uh, inverted and became Kimbisa in Cuba. You know, some of it is speculation. A lot of this is oral. Uh, oral, oral um, discussion and 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 uh, pass along. So there is a certain amount of speculation. And Lemba is the name of a specific uh, lineage that is still to this day found in Cuba. So all those words that are found in in in, in Central West Africa are active today in Cuba. I get so much of an education from you brothers <laughs> that dive into the history. Well, that's incredibly kind of you, brother Americo. I love that, Paez. Thank you so much for take, letting us take some time from you and uh, share your light and research into these these cultures. And it's just so fascinating with people in different parts of the world that, you know, and some of them, as you said, that had no contact with each other. They all ended up in the same place and, and seeking this light. So thank you so much for enlightening us with this episode. Thank you for having me, Michael. It's definitely a pleasure. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Craftsman Online Podcast, why don't you just go ahead and click that follow button and follow us on Spotify or pound subscribe and subscribe to the Craftsman Online Podcast on Apple Podcasts. We got new episodes coming at you every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Craftsman Online.